Eureka, Stephen Jesse Oslin, and the Gospel Music Business in Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Presentation by David Russell Hamrick. First presented May 2020 at the annual meeting of the Mountain Plains Music Library Association. One of the tools that I use in the library is the OCLC database. This is a giant union database of hundreds of libraries around the world. One of the things that this allows you to do is to search through millions of books and find things that have a common place of origin or were published during a particular period of time. Now what you see on this screen is music that was published in Oklahoma during or prior to 1907, the year of statehood. And one of the immediate trends you see is this Eureka Publishing Company. It is the first continuously operating publisher of music in Indian Territory, which would later become the state of Oklahoma. But this wasn't just a publisher of songbooks. These Shape Note Gospel songbooks contain advertisements for a monthly music magazine called the Eureka Messenger, and also the Eureka Normal School of Music housed in an attractive two-story brick building in downtown Stigler, Oklahoma. I ran across one of these books years ago, and my first thought was, I grew up with this kind of music, and I grew up in this state. Why have I never heard of this? The answers lie in the somewhat bittersweet story of Stephen Jesse Oslin, an Alabama native who became the forgotten pioneer of gospel music in Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Shape Notes started in 1801 with Smith and Little's Easy Instructor, using different shapes for the note heads to indicate the solfege syllables, and following the old English solmization system, Fa so la, Fa so la, Mi Fa. But during the 19th century, as European style music education began to take hold in the U.S., some Shape Note teachers adapted to the seven syllable Do Re Mi system of solfege and added another three shapes, as seen in Jesse Aitken's 1846 Christian Minstrel. These were also called patent notes, or character notes. In the Reconstruction era, Southern shape note music took two paths. The four shape books, such as the famous Sacred Harp, became monuments to antebellum folk tradition. Ironically, they also contained a lot of early Yankee music from the colonial era. The seven shape books, though, became the province of the newfangled reformers and educators, and stylistically were closer to the pop music influenced gospel songs of Philip Bliss or Fanny Crosby. The essential founders of this new shape note movement were Aldine Kiefer and Ephraim Rubush of the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, who promoted the system through songbooks, singing schools, and a monthly magazine of music, poetry, and chaste home literature called the Musical Million. They also established the Virginia Normal Music School to train music teachers, and by the end of the 1870s their extension schools reached as far as East Texas. With that background, we now turn to one of their aspiring acolytes. The first interaction between Stephen Oslin and Rubush and Kiefer was rather quaint. Oslin wrote to the Musical Million in 1881 to ask about a notation problem in one of their songbooks. In the same issue, Oslin called an organizing meeting for a musical convention in Scott County, Arkansas. That's one county south of Fort Smith along the border of Indian Territory. He wrote a more lengthy letter in 1884, reporting his decision to make music teaching his vocation. He says, Thinking that a few dots from this country would be of interest to your many readers, I write you. Cotton crops in the country were very poor, which called dull times. As to music, I think the good and noble-hearted people of Arkansas are beginning to see and realize the need of improvement in this branch of education. This is as it should be. I am engaged now in teaching this delightful science, have been teaching more or less for the past four years. I have just closed one school and have two others on hand. Some clarification of terminology will help understand Goslin's ambitions. A convention was an annual singing event organized on a county, regional, or state level, usually taking place over a weekend, and usually with lots of food. The singing schools were usually one to two weeks in length, taught daily at a local school or church, and emphasized learning music fundamentals and sight reading. 
a normal or teacher's institute, was usually three to four weeks and included subjects such as harmony and figured bass, keyboard accompaniment, voice training, and classroom skills. It was Auslan's ambition to bring this level of professionalism to singing school teachers in the Indian Territory as well. In 1888, Stephen Oslin became a minister in the Methodist Indian Mission Conference and was sent to Briartown along the South Canadian River in the southernmost part of the Cherokee Nation called the Canadian District. It's interesting to note that he was just eight miles downriver from Younger's Bend, which you may recognize as the home of Sam and Belle Starr, the outlaws. A letter to the Musical Million from a resident of nearby Brooken describes how energetic Oslin was in the local music scene. The gentleman says, About four weeks ago, Professor Oslin organized a singing class here and one at Casey Valley, also one at Mount Enterprise. He gave two lessons a week at each of the three places, closing the term Saturday, by concentrating the other schools at Brooken. Invitations sent to Briartown, Whitefield, Sanbois, and Callington brought a number of good singers together. It having been pretty well known that there was to be a musical convention organized and a picnic dinner given by the hospitable people of Brooken, and knowing that Brooken will not be surpassed, but always excels in everything, especially when it comes to getting up something to eat, it brought a fine crowd together. Oslin also remained involved with shape note organizations back in Arkansas. In 1890, he was elected president of the Union Musical Convention of the Western District of Arkansas in the Indian Territory and organized a normal school with James H. Rubush, son of the famous company founder. Rubush reported in the Musical Million, the success of the school is largely due to Reverend S.J. Oslin, who is not only a good preacher and a fine gentleman, but a first-class music teacher. In fact, we do not hesitate to say he is equal to any round or character note teacher in the South. Later the same year, Oslin was selected to co-edit a new songbook for Rubush and Kiefer, called Pearls of Truth in Song. With this string of successes, Oslin set his sights higher. The January 1891 issue of Musical Million contained the following glowing editorial announcement. The Tempo, another new music journal thoroughly devoted to our notation and pure home literature, is being published at Hackett City, Arkansas. The initial number promises good things from west of the Mississippi. Its editors are Rev. S. J. Oslin and J. H. Rubush. On with the work, brethren. Oslin soon opened the Tempo Music Company in Fort Smith, and in addition to the monthly journal, published at least one songbook called Zion's March in 1892. He also began to hold annual normal schools in Alabama and Texas. At the 1893 meeting of the Arkansas and Indian Territory Convention, Oslin was appointed to organize a permanent normal school in Fort Smith, which he announced as the Southern Conservatory Normal, wording that left no doubt of his aspirations. But something went wrong, and this normal school never happened. In the February 1894 Musical Million, the following notice appeared. The Conservatory Normal, which was to be held in Fort Smith, Arkansas, by E.T. Hildebrand, S.J. Oslin, and W.D.C. Botifer, was postponed indefinitely, owing to sickness, death, etc., that prevented some of the workers and interested parties from making the school a success. When a future date is agreed upon, the public will be informed of its session. It's interesting to note that the instrumental teacher secured for this normal school was W.D.C. Botifer, who was a German-born organist from St. Louis and also the first music teacher at the University of Arkansas. In March, the Musical Million reprinted an announcement from Oslin's Tempo Journal suggesting a complete collapse of Oslin's fortunes. With this issue of the Tempo, it ceases to exist as a separate journal and is consolidated with the Musical Million, published by the Rubush Kiefer Company of Dayton, Virginia which paper will go to our subscribers beginning with the March 94 number, and at which time the editor of this paper will in some way be connected with the million. Also, the proprietors of the Tempo Music Company become members of the Rubush Kiefer Company. What caused the failure of the Southern Conservatory Normal? It is possible that Oslin was incapacitated by an episode of malaria, as happened to him so often. But events on a larger scale worked against the school as well. The Panic of 1893 hit Arkansas that fall and crushed the cotton market. 
the merger of Oslin's businesses with the Rubish Kiefer Company seems to have been a friendly takeover, and perhaps was even a face-saving bailout. But the Tempo Music Company would not be Oslin's last attempt to establish his own empire. By the summer of 1894, S.J. Oslin was back in Indian territory, first selling pump organs and songbooks in Muskogee, and then back along the South Canadian River again as a located preacher at Enterprise in Texana. Somehow he still kept up a steady round of travels to teach normal schools in Indian Territory, Texas, and Alabama, and built up the local singing conventions in Indian Territory. In his new column, Southwestern Notes, for the musical Million, we also begin to see another aspect of his career. He excelled at cultivating relationships with mentors, peers, and students. Oslin made colleagues of competitors, such as Frank L. Island of Waco, Texas. He reported on the academic progress of his student teachers and supervised their entry into the field. Several of these would later become business partners, and a few would become successful songwriters and publishers on their own. At the end of 1898, Oslin announced that he was returning to full-time teaching, and by the next summer he unveiled his new brand, the Eureka Normal School of Music. He reported to the Musical Million from his new home in Enterprise, west of Stigler. Our normal at this place, the home location of the school, opened last Monday. We have above 60 in attendance, with more to follow. Texas and the Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw nations of the territory are represented. We have primary, intermediate, and advanced harmony classes, about 20 in the teacher's class, 25 in organ and piano class, and all are doing well. There is as much of genuine enthusiasm in this school as is ever found anywhere. The school is being held in my own music hall upstairs at my home, which I have had nicely fitted up for this purpose and seated with chairs. Other regular and preparatory sessions will be held from time to time, and this is only the beginning of a series of sessions which we certainly think gives promise of something good for the future. The Eureka Normal School of Music had its home in the northern Choctaw Nation, but as Osland advertised, sessions held anywhere in the South on the most reasonable terms. He took the Eureka School on the road for the rest of 1899, teaching four month-long normals in Texas, the Chickasaw Nation, and the Choctaw Nation. No less than Aldean Kiefer himself, the elder statesman of Shape Note Gospel, pronounced, Professor S.J. Oslin's normal schools are thoroughly deserving of any and all the patronage which may be bestowed upon them. Professor Oslin has proven himself to be a most excellent teacher of music, as well as an estimable preacher of the gospel. With the Eureka Normal School of Music as an established brand, Oslin extended his operations through his network of colleagues and former students. In July and August of 1900, for example, Oslin taught the home session at Enterprise while his Eureka Boys, as he called them, were holding Eureka Normals at four different locations in Indian Territory and Texas. The next step was publishing. Early in 1900, a book appeared called The Eureka Gym published by Rubush and Kiefer. Then in 1903, we have the first sighting of the company we saw in that OCLC database at the beginning of the presentation, the Eureka Publishing Company. The first two books under the new imprint were published in McAllister, but in 1904, the railroad connecting Muskogee to Fort Smith came through Stigler, and the Eureka Publishing Company was permanently established in that city in 1905. It was typical to produce these paperback songbooks at the rate of one per year, feeding the demand for new music to learn. But Oslin stepped up the frequency so that three or four books might come out the same year, which he managed by farming out the editing work to others. The Eureka Zion Harvester, published in 1910, was an interesting case of strategic collaboration. Oslin publicized a songwriter's convention in Stigler, which consisted of his own colleagues and students from different states and proceeded to compile a new songbook with built-in multi-regional appeal. With the Eureka Normal Schools and the Eureka Publishing Company, only one thing was lacking from the Rubush Kiefer business model, a music journal. The Eureka Messenger, a monthly magazine of music, poetry, religion, and literature, began in 1910. One might note in his advertisement on the screen that he says if you are interested in music, the morals of the people, and good government, you ought to be a reader. Oslin frequently delved into politics, 
and was a member of the Socialist Party in the 1910s. But S.J. Oslin's vision once again outstripped his circumstances. Financial troubles struck again with the effort to build that new two-story brick building the songbooks advertised so proudly. In the summer of 1914, the building had a grand dedication topped off by hosting the state singing convention. But at the same time, the company fell behind on debts held by the First National Bank of Stigler, which was also financing their building. In 1915, the bank brought suit over a loan that was past due. The Eureka Company disputed the interest on the loan because it was taken out by the company treasurer without the authorization of the president, but they lost the case on appeal in 1916. The situation was complicated by the fact that the treasurer was S.J. Oslin's son-in-law. The Eureka Publishing Company operated in Stigler on into 1918, publishing a few more songbooks, but Oslin's plan for a gospel music empire in Oklahoma was not to be. In August, he moved the company to Mena, Arkansas, and in 1921, he gave up controlling interest to his former students and partners. Like many other small publishers, the Eureka Company eventually fell victim to the Great Depression. S.J. Oslin passed away in June 1928 in Little Rock and was buried in the family plot back in Whitefield, Oklahoma. So how do we assess the career of S.J. Oslin? As a businessman, I think we know. He had a gift for putting the best face on things. He once referred to a class of 25 students as a quarter of a hundred. But that didn't pay the bills. But the Eureka Company was also a victim of time and place. It seems kind of eccentric today that Oslin so frequently began his letters by reporting on the cotton crop. But a good cotton year meant people had money to buy songbooks or to send a youngster to a music school. During the First World War and its aftermath, cotton prices fluctuated to an extent not seen since the Civil War, right when the Eureka Company needed stable growth. The shape note gospel business was also changing by the 1920s. The days when the whole town turned out for a gospel singing were coming to an end. Now there were movies, the radio, and the phonograph, and the gospel music companies that survived were those that adapted to the new media. In 1921, the year that Oslin finally gave up leadership of the Eureka Music Company, James D. Vaughn of Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, launched Vaughn Phonograph Records, and in 1923 went on the air with an all-gospel radio station. As a songwriter, it is fair to say that Oslin was mediocre. I can only find a handful of his songs that were reprinted in other collections after his death. By comparison, his Texas colleague Frank Island wrote at least a dozen songs that were still in print in the 1950s and 60s, and three or four of Island's songs are still sung today. In one area, however, Stephen J. Oslin succeeded admirably, as a teacher and mentor. Will Slater, one of Oslin's star pupils from the Stigler years, went on to publish songbooks for the a cappella churches of Christ, and a few of his songs are still sung in that fellowship. W. Oliver Cooper, Oslin's student and later co-publisher in Alabama, has more than 200 songs listed in hymnary.org. One of his songs, Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All, was the title track for a 1971 album by the Chuck Wagon Gang, which is a very big deal in Shape Note Gospel. James S. Torbett had a huge hit in 1924 with the song Glory Land Way, one of the best-known songs of the Shape Note Gospel style and one of the themes used in Carter Burwell's soundtrack for the 2010 remake of True Grit. The final chapter of S.J. Oslin's career sums up both his obscurity and yet the reach of his influence. In 1926, two years before he died, he was asked to teach harmony at the Hartford Musical Institute in Arkansas, a new school co-founded by one of his own students, J.A. McClung, coincidentally using the same name as the music normal Oslin had taught there in 1890. That fall, one of Oslin's students was a young man from LaFleur County, Oklahoma, who would become the most successful shape note gospel songwriter of all time, Albert Brumley, writer of the gospel classic I'll Fly Away. In Kevin Kerberg's excellent dissertation at the University of Kentucky about Albert Brumley, Kerberg mentions Oslin, but notes that, outside of his publications, very little information exists on Oslin. I hope that I have contributed something toward recovering this lost pioneer in the history of music of Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Thank you.